Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michael Burjali. I'm the executive director of TASH. I'm a white man with gray hair and I'm wearing a gray pullover and I'm sitting in front of a banner with the TASH logo behind me. Uh, we partner with Transcend on the S Center to provide technical assistance. This is the fifth and final year of the S Center and this is the second to last of our national community of practice webinars. We're really glad you're here. It's my pleasure to turn it over to Sean Roy, who is the Chief Training and Innovation Officer at Transcend and who co-manages the S Center Center, pardon me. And Sean will um, introduce the webinar and the panelists. So take it away, Sean. Perfect. Thank you, Michael and Donald. It's, uh, my name is Sean Roy. I am a white male. Uh, I used to have dark hair. I'm wearing a uh, white kind of checkered shirt in front of a very boring tan background. Uh, my apologies for that. Um, and want to say how thrilled we are uh, for everybody to join us today for this important topic. We know that um, people are starting to get zoomed out. And so anytime that we can see such strong interest in a training, we know that we've probably hit on something that people are very interested in. So we are excited to have you with us um, and excited to address this topic, uh, creating opportunities for youth with mental illness, a focus on transition and employment. So as Michael said, you know, the function of the YES Center or the Youth Employment Solution Center is to help states uh, with systems change activities related to improving employment outcomes for students with significant disabilities. And when we think about students with significant disabilities, I think most of the time, most of us automatically default to students with intellectual or developmental disabilities, or maybe you know very complicated uh, health conditions. But as we know, um, it's estimated that half of the adults in the United States will experience some type of mental illness. And we also know that um, there's a strong correlation between low employment rates and significant mental illness. And so the Yes Center team thought it was important in one of our last webinars to be able to shed light on this particular topic. And so we can really make that linkage to um, uh, youth with mental health concerns and some of the efforts that we see across the country, such as Employment First, such as securing school-based work experiences. We wanna make sure that youth with mental health concerns are part of the conversation. Um, I am absolutely thrilled and thankful to be joined by three wonderful guests today. Um, the first uh, person we're gonna be hearing from is Miss uh, Catherine Sabella. Catherine uh, Sabella, PhD, is the Director of Research at the Transitions to Adult Center for Research or the Transitions ACR within the Department of Psychiatry's Systems and Psychosocial Advances Research Center. Sorry for the ASL interpreter on that one. At the University of Massachusetts Medical School. In this role, she facilitates all aspects of research, training, and dissemination activities in close partnership with the Transitions ACR leadership. Her research interests include psychosocial development during the transition to adulthood, education disparities, and mental health policy and systems changes. Uh, she is joined today by Larry Abramson. I want to make a special note and thanks. Larry has uh, interrupted his vacation hiking the Appalachian Trail to find an Airbnb so he could join us today specifically. So thank you, Larry, for your commitment to the cause. Larry Abramson is a national leader in the provision of transition services to students with mental health challenges. He is a technical assistance specialist on the Way to Work Maryland project. Prior to this role, Larry served as director of vocational services at St. Luke's House, where he established the career transition program and was a site director for the Social Security Administration's funded youth transition demonstration program. He has helped design programs that bridge the gap between school mental health and vocational rehabilitation systems. 
Larry has designed employment programs that meet the career goals of students, as well as meet the needs of the business community. We are also joined today by Alexis Ume, who is a first generation college student currently at Boston University, and she's seeking her master's in school counseling, and she's going to share her experiences more towards the ends of our end of our session. I want to encourage folks, as Donald said, during the course of the session, if you have any questions or comments, I think lately what's really been neat is, is, is I've been on webinars as people will react real time with comments in the chat box, which I think is kind of neat, right? It gives us a sense that there are people out there. And, and so feel free to do that. We're going to do questions at the end. I also want to point out that um, on Friday, so June 25th, from 12 o'clock to 1.30 Eastern, Catherine and Larry are gonna be participating in what we call office hours. They are the, uh, it's an opportunity for anybody who's attending today to be able to get some, some kind of more close time with uh, Larry and, and Catherine, have a conversation with other people and ask questions who are interested, kind of an open-ended sharing based on this topic of, of youth with mental illness and employment. And, and the other office hours that we've held, they've been relatively small, but so robust in the conversation, the time just flies. So if you're interested in that kind of interaction, love to have you for the office hours as well on Friday. Um, and uh, so with that, um, I am going to hand it over to Catherine to get the ball rolling. Thank you, Sean. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, so I'm going to spend about 10, 15 minutes just kind of setting the stage for um, this topic and this population. Um, as somebody alluded to just now that um, sometimes employment services for young adults are really tailored towards young adults with developmental disabilities um, or physical disabilities. But there are a heck of a lot of young adults with mental health conditions who could benefit from and often qualify for employment services, especially even in high school. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot. I'm Catherine Sabella. I'm from the Transitions to Adulthood Center for Research at UMass Medical School. I am a ca Caucasian female with brown hair and glasses, um, and I'm sitting in front of a kind of teal colored wall. I just had this room painted, and I love the color. Um, so I do have some uh, figures that I will try to narrate as well on the screen right now is kind of a four part diagram of the pieces I'm going to cover. I've been working in um, the young adult mental health research and services um, arm for over 10 years. And when we start talking about young adults with mental health conditions, we often need to talk about general adolescence and young adulthood as its own developmental period then we need to consider the impact of mental illness across the lifespan. And then there's almost that intersection um, where young adulthood and mental illness meets for many, many young adults. And then um, today we really wanna talk a little bit about the employment and education experiences of young adults with mental illness. Next slide, please. So on the screen, I have a little bit of a cartoon. It's, it's kind of dated, but it just shows um, a girl who looks like a teenager talking to somebody who looks like her mother. It's a black and white drawing. And the caption says, don't call me a teenager. From now on, I want to be referred to as a pre-adult. Um, although this is somewhat dated, um, the point I'm making here is that adolescence and young adulthood um, sometimes is referred to in different ways, terms like emerging adults, transition age youth, just youth, um, or young adults. In my line of work and at our research center, broadly, young adulthood can be anything from age 14 to 30. Most often, um, mental health services um, refers to young adulthood as 16 to 25. Um, Larry's going to be talking a lot about high school experiences in a little bit. But either way, I want to make the case that emerging adulthood is kind of this um, new, somewhat new phenomenon in the last couple decades, um, understood as the distinct period of our life course that is between being a child and between being an adult. 
And it's characterized by change and exploration of life directions in many areas. Next slide, please. On my next slide, it says development of every front, on every front, and there's a image of just some puzzle pieces here. And the point here I'm trying to make is that development is rapidly occurring in young adulthood on every front. And together, um, this, these various developments underlie one's ability to function as an adult, i.e. meet adult expectations in any given society. So in the US, as um, I mean, um, young adults go through a lot of cognitive development, um, the frontal lobe <laughs> and the, the amygdala and all of the, the, I'm not a neuroscientist, but there is more brain, there is a rapid period of brain development second only to brain development in infancy during young adulthood. Young adults are developing their own morals and ethical standards. They're developing social beings and developing sexual social relationships. And this is a key point of identity exploration. The question of who am I is being asked among young adults. And many people are asking young adults, who are you and who do you wanna be when you grow up, air quotes. Next slide, please. So here I um, just wanna talk about social considerations. If you could press um, the button again, um, young adulthood used to almost not exist. I joke about my mom. She um, met my dad when she was 20. She got married and got her associate's degree when she was 21. She moved out of the house and into that marital home, promptly had babies. And, you know, that was all within like a two to three year span. Um, nowadays, young adulthood is kind of this elongated social developmental period. Rates of marriage among young people are decreasing rates of independent living or owning a home are decreasing. Many more young people are living at home longer and that was even pre-pandemic. Um, next click, please. Um, the age of marriage therefore is increasing if people decide to get married at all. Many are cohabitating for longer periods of time and many young people are delaying childbirth. And one more click, please. And in, again, the US and all developing countries, a high school, or many developing countries, a high school degree or equivalent is no longer enough to get ahead and to um, essentially live independently. Um, we have data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics that show there is a increased rate of return on additional years of education. So for every year of education one completes, um, I think they experience a 9% increase in income. So these are social considerations for all young adults of, in the US, not just young adults with mental illness. Uh, next slide, please. The last thing I'll say about youth and young adults, generally speaking, is they have their own subculture, okay? So it's a, it's a lengthened period of development. Um, and many of us or many people on this call who have teenagers or ever had can agree that youth often have their own subculture. On the screen are several images taken from pop culture, including pictures of um, Kim Kardashian and Kanye West and a, sign, a wording that says, you just don't get it. There's a Black Lives Matter image, the TikTok and Snapchat logos and pictures of people, young people taking selfies and being on the phone with each other. Um, young adults kind of have their own language. Um, I have rounded the bend to 240 and I find myself just not even able to really catch up with some of the young adults that I work with in terms of what is the newest social media platform and um, trends. So these are things, important notes about young adults in general. Next slide. So let's get to the second part, which is um, really considering mental illness across the lifespan. We know that the majority or about two thirds of mental illness and uh, or mental health conditions occur prior to the age of 25. The peak age of mental illness and disorder globally um, of mental illness onset is 14 and a half. And the majority of first episode of psychoses occur between the ages of 15 to 30. There's a chart on this slide that takes data from the National Survey of Drug Use and Health 
and shows in 2019 any mental illness by age group in the United States. And this shows that 29% of 18 to 25 year olds had some form of mental illness compared to only 25% ages 26 to 49 and compared to 14% of 50 plus. So this is illustrating that young adulthood is the time where many mental health conditions are developing or have already developed. Next slide, please. So what do we know about adults with mental illness? Because sometimes we, we, my center has to defend, well, you know, all adults with mental illness struggle and they're right. Um, adults with mental illness, generally speaking, the data show they have high rates of co-occurring substance use compared to adults without mental illness, lower rates of employment, low incomes, if they are working, they're often working in service-oriented jobs or jobs that we consider to be the secondary labor market, few benefits, low pay, um, things like that. Um, they are often involved in multiple systems, meaning um, they might be getting um, different social services from different sources. And there are high rates of dependence on social security benefits among adults with mental illness. So, Adults with mental illness, anybody over the age of 18 struggles. Again, the question begs, what's different about younger adults? We go to the next slide. You can click through this slide completely. Um, should be three clicks, perfect. So um, the first statistic I wanna share is that um, young adults, 18 to 25 year olds, again, according to the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, have the highest rates of serious mental illness compared to other ages. So rates of serious mental illness among 18 to 25 year olds is about 9% compared to only four and a half percent of 45 to 64 year, old, year olds. Um, but their service use is lower. So young adults, 18 to 25, only 56% of them are using health, mental health services compared to 75% of those between the ages of 45 to 64. And I just want to point out that I think a crisis was a mental health crisis was brewing pre pandemic and has only um, the pandemic has only added fuel to the fire. Rates of serious mental illness, again, according to the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, um, between 2008 and 2019, rates of serious mental illness among 18 to 25 year olds almost doubled. So in 10 years, 11 years, the rates of serious mental illness went from 3.8% to 8.6%. And we see a similar pattern or similar increase for serious thoughts of suicide among this population. And it's kind of terrifying to think about what data from 2021 will look like compared to 2008. Um, next slide, please. So I've laid the groundwork for the challenges of adults with mental illness, the challenges, and then the fact that we know young adults seem to have higher rates of mental illness compared to older adults. And being a young adult adds certain complications, not just because young adulthood has a specific subculture and not just because young adults are expected to do more than um, in previous years past, but young people with mental health conditions are often similarly compared to their peers experiencing higher rates of co-occurring substance use, high rates of justice system involvement, high rates of foster care involvement, and never mind the changing and complicated family dynamics that I could spend an hour or more talking about. And this is important, especially for young adults transitioning to adulthood with a mental health condition or with experience in multiple systems. There is a system issue here. And sometimes this is referred to as the cliff, if you will, where a child, an individual could be involved in child mental health services, could qualify for child mental health services in their state. But sometime between the age of 17 to 23, it's gonna vary. They are no longer, they no longer should be served, quote unquote, by the child serving, you know, Department of Mental Health. And now they need to be eligible for adult mental health services, and they might not be eligible. So they might lose services. If they are eligible, they need to change practitioners or change caseworkers because now they're on the adult side of things. And this is why we refer sometimes to a cliff 
Now they are also turning 18. Maybe they don't want to stay involved. And so then we never see them again. So the point here is that many young adults with mental health conditions have a lot of challenges. Not all of them, many of them just have higher rates of challenges compared to their peers without mental health conditions. And there are systemic and policy system barriers that contribute to complex um, navigation of services. And unfortunately, this is part of the reason we see that lower engagement among young adults. They now have a choice whether they want to stay engaged or not. So this brings me to my final point, which is thinking about on the next slide, um, employment and educational experiences of young adults with mental illness. There's an image here of, um, I think, uh, two young people um, kind of studying or looking at some work together. Um, young people with mental illness um, compared to their peers without mental illness have lower rates of high school graduation. They, um, if they are employed after high school, they often are in short-lived jobs with short tenures, often are um, experiencing jobs again that are more just retail service-based industries. They're not really getting many benefits. If they are pursuing post-secondary training or education, i.e. college, um, well, they're, they're usually, they have lower rates of enrollment um, compared to their peers without mental health conditions. And this is some of this data is also compared to peers with other types of disabilities. Um, but often they have low graduation rates. They experience lots of academic disruptions and the associated crippling student debt that often comes with that. Um, for example, I, I interviewed about 55 young adults um, a few years ago and asked about their school and work experiences. Um, these were young adults who were slightly older, 25 to 30. And many of them had very nonlinear um, paths of school and work exploration. Um, and many of them, these, these, <laughs> these young people are smart. You know, it, you, having a mental health condition does not mean you're not smart. They were capable and oftentimes getting really good GPAs. They just were ha having trouble managing life and therefore often were, were dropping classes and then required to pay for credits they never even, never even earned. So I think my next slide is my last slide. And here I just highlight what we've learned from our work and from the study I just mentioned about what are the, some of the key barriers to success and the facilitators to success based on my conversations with many young adults. Um, think factors that contributed to short-term stints in school education, um, school work or training. They often describe stress-induced anxiety or panic. Um, often in the workplace or when it came to performing in school. Um, sometimes they just described needing to quit their school or work experiences because their symptoms increased or medication changes forced them to really um, not be able to function enough to get to work and then they would get fired or they would miss two weeks of college and their professors were not willing to really help them make up that time. And oftentimes they were experiencing interpersonal conflicts that they had trouble managing in, in school or work settings. Um, they didn't know how to manage conflict or they had traumatic backgrounds that um, made them really fear conflict. But facilitators to success um, included when school training or work environments were flexible and um, supportive, when professors were able to say, it sounds like you've been going through a really hard time why don't you get that assignment to me next week? Um, supervisors who would say, do what you need to do to take care of yourself. I'll see you next week. Um, the ability to take a break on a job or the ability to maybe remote in to school or online learning. So this last slide here shows that although they're, they face challenges with the proper supports, young adults can thrive if we better understand their experiences and um, their challenges and their successes. Um, and I will say young adulthood is the pivotal and age normative time for career exploration, right? This is the time 
no matter when you were a young adult, how long ago, you were learning, you were working, you were learning about yourself, even if you were scooping ice cream and or you know waiting tables, you were learning about yourself as a worker. And young people with mental health conditions, if they are unable to experience those early career exploration activities, their long-term career trajectories can really be impacted um, in terms of long-term income and ability to live independently. I have a dear friend who cons considers young adulthood, she calls it a crisitunity, this idea that there are a lot of crises in young adulthood. There are a lot of crises when you're a young adult with a mental health condition, but there's so much opportunity in young adulthood that if we can just remember that and tap into the opportunity and provide young people the support they need, they will live successful lives. That is my last slide. I will turf it over to Larry um, and he will get going. Um, and then I'm seeing some chats come in, but maybe we can come back to those questions unless you guys want me to address them now. Catherine, I think that let's have Larry go through his um, section first and we'll catalog the questions and save time at the end. Sounds great, thank you. Thank you. All right, can you see me? Yes. Yep, Larry, we've got you, we can see you and hear you. Okay, that's good, I can't see myself, but that's probably fine. And I am a white male with a black University of Maryland polo shirt on. And uh, I'm in the basement of an Airbnb in Hopewell Junction, New York. That, uh, you know, thank you for having me here. That uh, um, I guess I just want to start my uh, presentation by saying that I believe that uh, uh, anybody with a disability is capable of working. I believe certainly that, that youth and young adults with mental illness are capable of working. And I think a critical marker in people's uh, career and educational uh, progress is having a paid job prior to exiting high school. It gives folks um, some uh, confidence that they can make it in that big bad world post, post high school. Next slide. So Catherine, uh, you know, talked about some of the, cha uh, the challenging data on uh, youth and young adults. And here's some more data that uh, high school students with an emotional behavioral dis disorders are more are a vulnerable population, often unrecognized and underserved in existing school based services. They're more likely to drop out of high school than any other group of students. They're less likely to participate in post-secondary education than many other students with disabilities. They're more likely to have low wages, low employment rates and poor health. And they're identified by teachers as the population they feel least equipped to serve. So uh, it's, a, it's a not very promising information here. Next slide. So, um, you know, in the world of mental health employment that we've had some uh, fantastic services being developed, you know, specifically the IPS, the Individual Placement and Support um, a program that's probably the most researched vocational service that there is. And that uh, they do a fabulous job of supporting people with serious mental illness uh, uh, attain employment and be supported by a collaborative uh, uh, group of folks within a mental health center. Uh, one of the issues though, is that those services, it's challenging to access those services when you're in high school. And so uh, they've written a new manual and, and there's a specific support, transition age youth support employment manual. But the reality is that, that engaging those students is very hard. And here are some strategies that, that uh, practitioners, whether they be educators or voc, uh, voc rehab professionals or uh, agencies can use to engage students. You know, first to meet the student at school or in the community. 
Second is to listen without judgment. The third is use a strength-based approach, really to focus on what the student can do well and what they're interested in. Conduct career assessments based on student interests. Create opportunities for the student and the young adult to see how other students and young adults have benefited from the service. Also really create opportunities for the student to meet employers and ask them questions. Create opportunities for the participant to learn about the pros and cons of their career interests from someone who's working in that field. I remember uh, having a, a young adult that was uh, really interested in, in auto mechanics. And uh, he got to spend a day at my garage in uh, White Oak, Maryland, and talking and watching and helping all the uh, uh, mechanics that were working on our cars. And uh, he learned so much from that day about their experiences of, of loving cars as a, as a young adult and now working in the field and some of the challenges of, of being a mechanic full time. That, that so whether you're interested in being an engineer or a mechanic or a salesperson or a doctor, you know, to have the opportunity in high school to talk to someone in that field and learn more about it is invaluable. Uh, when you talk to students, you know, everybody has to start in the bottom. You know, we have two, 197 participants here and whatever, whatever field you're in, that you started in the bottom, probably in an internship or an entry level position and you worked your way up. And that, that I think, it, you know, it's, it's important for all students to understand what a career ladder is and what education is required to do it. Not to, not to be a dream squasher, but just to, to let them know what the steps are in order to be successful. Next slide. So um, I'm gonna do a little background on uh, WIOA in that um, about oh, seven years ago, the federal government changed um, their uh, uh, policies and uh, said that Voc Rehab had to use 15% of all its uh, money on uh, youth prior to exit of high school. And in that, they created something called pre-employment training services. One of those pre-employment training services was work-based learning experiences. And that has offered um, a, a large swath of, of uh, high school students an opportunity to learn on the job and experience uh, um, uh, a particular career that they might be interested in. And it is funded by State Folk Rehab and that I'm just doing this little slide to compare work-based learning experiences with a, with a typical paid job. So uh, work-based learning experience, experience is a temporary position that, that lasts six to eight weeks. Whereas a paid job can be permanent, temporary or seasonal and that, that many times a typical high school student is going gonna, is gonna to work at that for, for some time for pay. A work-based learning experience is, is really a learning tool. And there's an agreement signed by the student, the employer, parents, and provider with specific learning goals. And that whereas... Uh, regular employment, if someone applied for a job at a landscape company and they were 16 or 17 years old, then, you know, they would just fill out the, uh, the paperwork and, uh, and be an employee of that particular uh, organization, whereas a work-based learning experience is really a, uh, um, uh, an outgrowth of the educational system with a, a learning opportunity within the, um, the you know, within the business that, um, and that, uh, that has uh, been uh, fascinating to be, to be honest, because as a, now I've used this term, I hope I don't offend anybody. I'm a born again, supported employment guy. I've spent my whole career with supporter employment, specifically paid jobs and in integrated environments. 
And when I heard about work-based learning experiences, I, I was uh, up in the air about whether, whether I saw thought the, about the benefits of it. And I'm, I'm sold that uh, I was surprised that employers would sign these agreements. I was surprised that students, especially students with mental health issues, would agree to this thing of piece of paper and learning goals and all that, but it's, it's worked out beautifully. Uh, the other thing is work-based learning experiences can come with a stipend. So the student can get paid to learn about a particular career that they might be interested in. And you can be very innovative about how you give students that, those opportunities. And in a regular pay, paid job, of course, employers pay regular wages. That um, uh, also that, that job tasks in work-based learning experiences are customized to meet student learning girls' interests and support needs. In a paid job, that reasonable accommodations can be provided to support the employee in meeting the essential functions of the job. So it's a, it's a different, different mindset. You know, on the job supports are available and regular contact with the employer is required. I'm talking about the support staff and in paid jobs, youth may choose not to disclose their disability and receive supports before and after work. Um, students may access multiple work-based learning experiences to learn about multiple careers. We all know that, that um, I guess the average person now changes careers every five years, but we have many students that came to us where they were interested in being a policeman and a nurse and a, uh, um, and a mechanic, all three. They, they, they weren't sure what they wanted to do. And we were able to, you know, to help them get these short-term work-based learning experiences in three separate environments that really gave them a better feel about what it's like to work in those careers. Um, for students that go directly into paid work, you know th that, that you can make those changes and change from job to job to job, but that, that, that sometimes that doesn't look as good on a resume. Typically, teenagers change jobs a lot. It's not that big of a deal, but the, but the access to these multiple opportunities are, is so positive through, through these work-based learning experiences. Next slide. So uh, for the past uh, three and a half years, I've been working on a, um, on a Way to Work uh, project, which is Way to Work Maryland, where we helped uh, students with uh, disabilities, juniors and seniors in high school, uh, get these work-based learning experiences. And, um, that, that I have a whole you know, section about this way to work program. To the right here is the individual placement and support IPS for transition age youth, which is a system I've also worked on that is fabulous, that, that they, the people there do a, a great job. It's integrated with, with uh, mental health teams. And that's also, a, 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 you know, it's, a, it's a great way to work with youth. My experience is that students in high school feel a little more comfortable in accessing their supports through school than through some, some other place, whether it be a mental health center or a housing program or uh, other mental health services. So the, the, here, I've just got a little chart here with the parallels and that, that so, um, in Way to Work, we believe that all students can work and pay jobs with supports. In IPS, the belief that all clients can work and pay jobs with supports, same thing. Both services use a strength-based approach, finding what the students can uh, or young adults are good at uh, find, and, and building on that to help find a, a career or position that, that they're gonna like and they can be successful at. In, uh, in way to work that using work-based learning experiences that the eligibility is, is, is wide. 
in order to be eligible for a work-based learning experience through voc rehab, you need to either have a documented disability, a 504 plan or an IEP. That's a large group of people. For IPS, historically, you it's for youth with serious mental health concerns are eligible. And each state varies as to, as to uh, what exactly that means. I know in Maryland that, that um, they allow for some more adolescent diagnoses with some, uh, some additional barriers attached to it, you know, like that, that um, you know, involvement with just juvenile justice, homelessness, serious behavioral issues, that allows them to get in as well. But, you know, the through WIOA, work-based learning experiences was designed to have a wide swath of, of eligibility. And um, that, that in many states, I know in Maryland, that, that they've been inundated with uh, applications for work-based learning experiences because it has been uh, very successful and uh, the field is learning more and more about it as, as it becomes more popular. So work-based learning experiences prepare students for careers and further education. Uh, certainly in IPS, competitive integrated employment is the goal, but students can choose internships, training and education toward that goal. Work-based learning experiences are based on student interests. IPS services are based on client interests. Work-based learning experiences are customized based on student learning goals. And here employers can offer reasonable accommodations so their employees can meet the essential functions of the job. So that's a difference between a real paid job and a, and a work-based learning experience. You know, you, you have to meet those, those essential functions of the job. In way to work, high schools were the hub of services. And uh, that in IPS, typically mental health centers, housing programs, first episode psychosis programs can be the hub for the, of services. Can you uh, raise that chart a little bit? There's one more section. All right, uh, next slide. So employer benefits of work-based learning experiences. They prepare the future workforce to meet industry and business needs that expands career and industry awareness for students and employers. It grooms the future workforce on employer expectations, you know, and a lot of the soft skills as well. They receive support by transition professionals to help students meet employer expectations. And their short term, the commitment is typically six to eight weeks. So in, in as we marketed work-based learning experiences to the, to the business community, and we talked about this is, this is the government and schools preparing students for the workforce and learning more about your industry. Employers really bought into that. And we had, we had a fabulous response from the, from the employers that we uh, work with. Next slide. So student benefits of work-based learning experiences. By definition, work-based learning opportunities are an educational approach that puts youth in the workplace and offers opportunities to learn about careers, career preferences, work behaviors, and specific uh, jobs and occupational skills. These opportunities allow youth to connect school experiences to real life work activities, which in turn contribute to their career success. Opportunities for more than one experience allow students to clarify their interests, preferences, skills, and real world work environments. And these experiences build soft skills, strengthen resumes, create employment references and networks, builds interviewing skills, and helps clarify post-secondary educational decisions. You know, for the VR counselors that are out there, when you have a young adult that just exited high school that comes into your office with no work experiences and no references, that is a challenge. You have a student coming in with these work-based learning experiences with references from their supervisor makes a, makes a big difference. Also that, you know, students used these, um, 
uh, work-based learning experiences to help make their post-secondary decisions about uh, what school, what they're going to study, um, um, you know, in which direction they think at this point their, their life might take. Next slide. So here are some quotes from the uh, Way to Work program that, that from parents. Uh, first, we love the focus on career interest. We did, a, we did a, um, some focus group with parents and that was across the board. My kid got to really say what they're interested in. And then the, 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 the employment specialists that work with them worked hard to find uh, a work-based learning experience that met their interests. We have another student, uh, Chris, this was, where his mom said, before he started his work experience was my son was failing at school, not communicating with us, sleeping in class. After these work experience, he has a career focus, he has plans for college and he believes in himself. Um, another mom said, I think Alex has really benefited a lot from these experiences. As he said, it gave him the opportunity to learn what he was interested in and really hone in on that. Uh, he even, he left the work-based experience, this, this gentleman, and he uh, went to Costco because it paid more money. And he had a bad experience there, but it gave him the opportunity to know that even though that he was paid well, it wasn't something he liked and he didn't want to pursue it. Now he's moved on to college. And as he said, it gave him a focus, uh, um, the things that I need to do or want to do in my future. Next slide. That's it. So that uh, I imagine there'll be a lot of questions. And I think even Sean wants to ask a couple of questions. Well, for sure. Thank you to both Catherine and, and Larry. We've gotten questions uh, in the question box too. I do have a couple of things I wanted to follow up on though. We're gonna again do, we'll do questions at the end for a lot of the questions that we've gotten. Um, but this is great information and, and certainly two sides of this topic. I want to start with um, with Catherine and this idea that um, you know you talked about given the fact that youth with with mental health disabilities have low rates of engagement in mental health services, what strategies can the people listening use to be able to engage youth in those types of services? Uh, thank you, Sean. Great question. And Larry, thanks for your content as well. I mean, Larry had a slide which I can build off of on um, engagement strategies for um, employment. And I think my answer to this question is usually um, thinking about the cultural, social, developmental um, uniqueness of young adulthood, which is why I present on those kind of topics. Um, and what I mean is, is two things come to mind is one, be helpful. <laughs> um, young adults, if they're looking for help, um, be helpful and, and try to meet that need as quickly as possible. Um, two is um, meet the young adult where they're at. And um, I maybe say the third thing is, is just be, is being a good listener. So those are three of the basic things. And I think specifically, I'm, I'm sure everybody would agree no matter what your age, um, you'd want those things. But for young people, um, you know, they get a bad rap for, for wanting instant gratification, but who can blame them? They've grown up on cell phones. They've grown up on th with things at their fingertips. This is not necessarily their fault. It's just where they grew up and how they've been groomed. So we need to understand that. Um, certain practices in mental health services, um, need to kind of be bent a little bit. And I'm hopeful that some things from COVID might carry over. So the ability to meet via Zoom, the ability to meet at flexible times, the ability to communicate um, ways that young people are communicating. There's an access center here in Massachusetts where one of the peer workers has been conversing with many young adults through something called Discord. And this is where I felt really old because I've never heard of Discord. And Discord is, is a chat feature, it has groups, and he's like, that's how I communicate with all the young people. And so it's not just texting, but it's using Snapchat and, and Instagram and other things to communicate with them. And I will say that many times um, 
policies around no shows. While you know no shows are important for certain services, um, this this group does have um, a tendency to no show. And then if they've lost that trust, often it's like, all right, well you have to start from the beginning, you know, or something like that. So I think there are some policies there. And I guess the other important thing I always think about is is integrating um, services. And so. The employment services are important. Um, one benefit of IPS, like Larry said, is often at employment services in, embedded in mental health services. Here in Massachusetts, we've had a lot of um, success with these young adult access centers where there are not therapists in the building, but it's almost a hub, a place where young people can come and they can get connected to their mental health services or help with a resume or help with housing. One-stop shopping is really um, important. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah, you know, Catherine, I've got um, teenagers myself and I often find myself completely lost. Uh, so I appreciated that information. Um, and, you know, I, I, Larry, I really enjoyed the information on work-based learning because that is, um, you know, the basis of a lot of the work that, that I do on the day-to-day -day base, uh, day -to my day-to-day. -day. Um, and, you know, you, I was struck by something you said about, you know, teachers maybe feeling kind of less equipped to, and to be able to deal with this population. I'm also wondering too, if that doesn't carry over to employment specialists and vocational rehabilitation staff as well, being able to feel like they have the capacity to, to really provide adequate supports to young people with mental illness. Can you speak to that a little bit as to why do you think that apprehension exists? Well, I, I mean, first, first off, that, that whether it be at an agency or um, in a voc rehab, a state voc rehab program, uh, I really believe in the specialized caseloads. And so that, that having a, um, a specialized transition caseload or with the proper numbers, a specialized uh, mental health transition caseload that I think it will, will be fairly, very, very effective. That, that um, in terms of the teachers that, that, um, I mean, I think that, that, you know, students with mental health issues can be very, can be successful in academics. That uh, in fact, the structured nature of academics can really help a, help a student with, the, with mental health issues because it's exceptionally clear about what's, what's required. When you go out into the world of work, the social aspects of, of uh, the environment, the work norms aren't quite as clear and, there, and, there's, and there's more challenges. That for teachers, they look at the variability of people's mental health issues that go, you know, that go up and down. And so targeting some specific strategies um, is very hard on an IEP, and it might be much easier to, to, you know, not deal with it essentially and focus on the other disability that, that the student has because they can really write the IEP correctly. And I know, Catherine, you do some work on uh, IEP support as well, don't you? A little bit. My colleagues do more than I, but yes. Gotcha. Gotcha. So that, that um, and, you know, that, that, as Catherine said in her uh, in her presentation, that that uh, the focus of of uh, special education has been on people with physical disabilities and and developmental disabilities, and so the education that that's received in the in the uh, graduate schools and the training that's received within uh, within special education focuses on that. So we, we I, I believe we need more training and more specialization for transition teachers. Great, thank you. 
I want to just say, Alexis, I, uh, I'm going to throw uh, I'm going to throw it to you here in just a minute. But I wanted to prep you and, and let you know that is coming. We've had some great responses in the chat box. Um, I just wanted to go over just a few of these. Um, somebody asked for for our Q and A. Uh, please address how this um, this is the age where sexual orientation can be challenged, posing other stressors impacting mental health. So maybe we will be able to address that um, uh, in our Q and A. Uh, somebody also said schools need safe zones for teachers who self-identify with mental health or L LGBTQ, take away the stigma of being different. Um, somebody also said great presentation about work-based learning and the benefits and the opportunities of young adults. Um, we are having some good experience with work-based learning here in Arizona. Trauma-informed practices are also important with this group of folks asking what happened to you instead of why did you. Um, somebody also said employers also don't usually know how to deal with mental health issues with their employees. So we've had a lot of engagement on this um, topic, which is really great. And we're gonna get to these questions uh, a little bit later, but I want to introduce um, Alexis Ume. Alexis, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Hi. So Alexis, um, like I mentioned, is, is a young lady from the Boston area. She is currently seeking her master's degree in school counseling at uh, Boston University, um, and she's a first-generation college student, um, and she is going to talk to us about some personal experience. And I think it's so important. And I thank you, Alexis, for being here. So important that we hear directly from people um, to, to really make this experience real. And she's going to talk to us about navigating depression and trauma, all while trying to be successful in high school and college. And so uh, without any further ado, Alexis, why don't you go ahead and tell us your story? Yeah, thank you so much, Sean, um, and everyone for having me. Um, my name's Alexis Yume. Um, I'm 24 years old. I'm a Black woman wearing a blue t-shirt right now and a green bandana. I'm having quite a bad hair day today. Um, and I'm in my makeshift, makeshift office um, at my parents' home right now. So yeah. Um, but yeah, I definitely do want to um, kind of continue on the note of my experiences um, in high school and having depression. Um, so I struggled with depression, I want to say, around sophomore, junior year of high school. Um, I was formally diagnosed with it, um, I believe, in my sophomore year. Um, and it was quite a lot to take in personally. Um, I'm the oldest of four siblings. Um, I'm Nigerian-American. My father emigrated here um, for college um, and met my mom. Um, so I, yeah, there's just a lot that goes with that, even just kind of unpacking that. Um, there's a lot of stigma about mental health within my family. And I'm sure within the greater community too. So that was something that I had to kind of cope with and deal with um, at that time. Um, but I want to say, for the most part, I had a great uh, school counselor that I talked to a lot about um, with that. So I definitely talked to her first and foremost about academics and just school. Um, I'm a top student. I really took like school and education very seriously. Um, obviously, stemming from my family and being the first of many to do these things. So I just think that I always wanted to do my best. Um, but yeah, again, going off of that pressure, I think that coupled with being diagnosed and thinking about what that meant in my family, I, think I struggled a lot with how to be productive, how to, how to juggle the expectations that I had. Um, so again, all of this kind of fell on the shoulders of my school counselor in terms of unpacking it and just kind of reflecting because I really felt like I couldn't, I couldn't dig as deeply as I wanted to with this with my family. Um, so I definitely did rely on her for the support. Um, and she was really like, I just thinking about her just warms my heart because I really truly think that she's the reason why I'm now pursuing school counseling. Um, so very full circle moment. Um, and we've shared that over and over again, um, my like gratitude for her. Um, but yeah, it was just little, it'd be little things like just her coming into my classroom sometimes or coming into homeroom and just taking me out of the classroom and asking like, how am I doing today? Um, how was finals, how was exams, how ups and downs of the week, how's family? Like she was just always really checking in. Um, so I definitely think that that helped me um, get through my experiences in high school and then getting ready for that transition to um, college and ap actually applying. And that's, again, when, like, I think I struggled the most um, in high school, my senior year, um, and just kind of preparing for what it meant to be independent, what it meant to be an adult, 
um, what it meant again to be a first generation college student and kind of being the first of um, my family and having that pressure again um, on my shoulders. So that came a lot with um, just calling out of work, like little things like I depression, it, it looks different for everyone. I definitely do wanna say that. Um, and for me, um, I think it just looked a lot like calling out um, of work, um, asking for extensions on papers and just like really procrastinating which is something that I normally don't do or don't consider myself doing um, as a student. I think that I pride myself on being proactive ahead of the game, really organized. But I think during my senior senior year again of high school, um, going into freshman year, I struggled a lot with just trying to stay on top of everything. Um, I really wanted to have a job and be a student and do all of this stuff. And it was just, um, it felt like I really was drowning sometimes. Um, but yeah, um, getting into that too, I went to UMass Amherst um, for college. Uh, it was quite an experience, pretty, a pretty large school if anybody here is from Boston or knows. Um, there's roughly 35,000 undergrads um, that go to UMass Amherst. Um, and it, it kind of was like a tunnel, it was like a pipeline from my high school actually, I went to Milton High. So many students from my school had actually went to um, college. So it, was, it almost felt like a high school experience continued or part two. Um, but yeah, again, those same kind of issues came up about keeping on top of schoolwork, um, trying to ask for help, and again, finding that person I could connect with. Because I think that one thing that really worked for me um, in terms of getting support through that um, phase of high school to college, and then also kind of coping with my own mental health um, issues was having that go-to person. Um, me personally, I really prefer one-on-one -on -one support. Um, I'd rather that than having like maybe three or five people I have to check in with or offices I have to go to and people I have to get in touch with and things of that nature. Um, but just being able to have someone I can pick up the phone and call or someone I can email and know that they'll respond back to me was something that I really depended on in high school. And I was hoping to get in college. Um, and it took some digging. It took some uh, a lot of advocacy on my own part that I had to do in order to do that. But I really think that that um, as institutions, maybe thinking about how we can make the accessibility to students a little easier might, um, might break that barrier. Um, so yeah, my experience in college now thinking about freshman year and onward. Um, I failed a couple of classes my freshman year. I went in wanting to be a psychology pre-med major. Um, psychology, my interest, pre-med was my dad's. He wanted me to go to medical school and I failed every single one of my pre-med courses. I took three, um, three pre-med courses and two psych classes. Past the psych classes, I was very proud of myself, loved it, um, really interested in psychology, but I struggled so much with biology, chemistry, statistics, all this, the hard sciences and math. Um, and I felt really like just down, like I felt like I was failing and I wasn't doing well in school. So I went to my professors a lot because naturally I'm just like, how can I do better in this class? And it wasn't even, it never really kind of got deep as deeply as um, conversations with my counselor about my mental health. But I think that just that window of how am I doing in this class gradually opened up into how are you doing at home? How are you doing? How are you studying? Like, how are you living on campus? Things of that nature. Um, so I think that that for sure was another thing that really helped me through college is just being able to kind of have professors who cared about um, me out, outside of being a student, um, who actually cared to ask how I was doing. Um, and it's interesting to say, but like just thinking again, like UMass is a very big school. They, they're not obviously gonna be checking on every single student, but I think it's good to kind of check in on students before they get to that, okay, you're failing and it's, it's what, what else can we do? It's kind of being more proactive and being like, hey, you know, I just want to check in on you, even if you are doing really well in class, how are you doing? I think um, it goes a long way. Um, so yeah, I think I had a lot of professors like that where I was able to just check in with them and say, I'm struggling. Um, I'm not really sure what I'm doing right now. I'm My head's not in it. What can I do? And it would gradually talk about extra credit, um, extensions on assignments, um, alternative assignments. If I couldn't, if I just felt like I really was too overwhelmed or I couldn't um, write a paper, I would be allowed to do maybe a project uh, or a oral presentation. So just being able to be more flexible, I think went a long way as well. Um, but again, I definitely kind of latched on having, having that go-to um, advisor, that one person. So I wanna say roughly around my sophomore year, I got assigned a academic advisor and I actually had to seek out one um, through like the multicultural student um, center. It was like a black student union um, thing, but um, they offered, they matched me with someone. She was actually really amazing. She herself was a first generation student, a woman of color, um, and just so many things that we had in common. So I think that even just being able to have someone like her I can go to also really became um, a great support system for me. Um, I hope I'm not running over time. <laughs> I can't tell. Um, but yeah, just kind of uh, thinking overall about my experience and what kind of helped me get through my challenges, I think was always 
just people who cared um, and just checked in with me, I think for sure. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if there's any specific questions, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that's great. This is great, we appreciate you sharing. Um, you know, specific to employment, do you have any experiences, you know, for example, when you were, when you were in high school or getting through college, were you able to kind of maintain a job outside of, of your schooling? Um, and if so, you know, what was the, did you experience kind of the same anxiety, depression in, you know, while searching for a job and feeling like you had to achieve there? Mm -hmm. um, or, or, or maybe when you think about when you're finished with your schooling and employment, what type of accommodations, if any, do you feel like you're going to need to be successful as a school counselor? Mm. That's interesting because one question takes me back to high school and one I'm thinking about now. Um, I think go going back to high school and working, um, for one, like I said, I've always, I've, being the oldest, I feel like I had a lot of um, expectations. So I was working at a very young age. Um, I start, started working, I think, 15. Um, so I was able, I was very, you know, comfortable being able to multitask and do a bunch of things. And I think a lot of the time I was in denial about how I was feeling. Um, so I think that I really just pushed through um, at times and just went to work and kind of was zoned out or got through what I had to do, but really wasn't really mentally there. Um, but I definitely think that there were also tough days to um, where I would call out of work um, and I wasn't even really sick and I just didn't really know what words to use to describe how I felt but saying I, I didn't feel good was just enough for me and I just wouldn't come in for a couple of days. Um, eventually I, I'm not even going to lie back in high school too I was not I knew I wasn't as reliable as I am now so I'm glad that I the self-awareness is back but um, I think that I definitely would quit jobs sometimes if I just felt like I couldn't handle having that conversation with my boss about I need time. Like, I think that it would sometimes those little small things that really could just fix situations. I got so scared and so overwhelmed and so anxious that I just would avoid them altogether. And it was just not a good, um, not a positive situation for me. So I think having my counselor also really helping me, giving me the skills and the, the language to even say, if you need help, here's what you do. I, I It helped me see that I could actually, you know, um, cope with and manage my um, stress. So if you, if you could go back then, I mean, what would be your advice to, to young people that may find themselves in that same situation? You know, what exactly, you know, kind of maybe young people that are, are, are very stressed out about their job and experiencing what you did, instead of quitting, what advice would you give them to maybe make the situation work for them? Yeah, great question. And I think even now that's a question that I'm hoping I get a more um, a wider and more clear answer on too, because I'm trying to be a mental health um, professional and caretaker myself. Um, but I think that for sure it is one to advocate for yourself. And two, if that is too hard to do at times, find someone that can advocate on your behalf. Um, I think a lot of the times as students, we, that power dynamic of being a student and having to go to a professor or go to a teacher or someone of a higher power figure than you that can be a little intimidating and scary to ask for help or say that I'm like struggling. Um, so I think that sometimes it might be helpful if us are, I'm speaking as a student and as an educator, but I think as educators, it might be helpful to reach out um, so that student won't have to make that first step every time. I think it's good to obviously encourage them to do so and advocate for themselves, but um, I think it's important to have someone, uh, anyone to go to. Um, at least that, that's, that's, that's what's worked for me in my, my experience. We had a, uh, Alexis, we had a great question coming through the chat box um, and I just lost it because uh, there's a lot of people chatting and it's great. Um, it basically, it was, what would your advice be to, to people who are supporting young people? You had said that you had trouble articulating it, right? Mm -hmm. You had trouble putting a, a name to it or putting thoughts to it. But but you know, there's a lot of people out there who are working with young people that might be in similar situations. Any thoughts or advice to those professionals to help those young people articulate it better? I mean, what would have helped you so you could have really lent a voice to it? That's a great question. And I, that's like the core of what we do. So that's why it's, it's very hard for me to really, like I, it's hard to call out warning signs, um, but hindsight's 2020. So I, I really, uh, I, I really am struggling. But I, I, I don't know. I think that really just building that rapport with the student will go a long way. Because I mean, 
Like, I just think that the relationship at times, it might reveal more. And sometimes it's not even like a student has to say these things for you to then translate. It might just be like, okay, you interpret based off of their body language a certain day. And it's now, I think, you know, like, I think it sometimes it really just matters on those small moments um, that we might kind of overlook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that almost speaks to kind of a need to train people, right? To be able to, to translate the things that they are observing mm -hmm. and to maybe be, use certain la supportive language to be able to help people, right? So it's not maybe an immediate thing, but it's more of a relationship building process so, that yeah. you, get, you get to that point where you can have these conversations. Um, what I want to do is I want to bring Larry and, and Catherine back in uh, along with Alexis. So Alexis, you stay put. And I want to do um, some questions. We have about 15 minutes left and we got a lot of great questions uh, and the people in the chat are, are having fun too. So this has just been wonderful. Thank you everybody who is playing along. Um, so let's Can just- Can I interject something, Sean? Absolutely, yeah. Awesome, just first of all, Alexis, fantastic job. Thank you for being here and sharing your experiences. And I thought that last question that Sean lobbed to you was a tough one, just about like how the articulation of what you're feeling. And this is something I've started to explore in my own research with young people. And somebody earlier asked a question about, um, I should go back and make sure I'm, I'm reading it right, but it was something about um, in youth subculture, how do they refer to mental illness? What language do they use? And I think this is the, the million dollar question. Um, I find, you know, we hear this term mental health literacy a lot, and it's almost like young adults or people in general don't know mental health. They have to get on board with, I'll say, our service policy definition of mental illness, right? And I actually think the, the opposite is true. I think to engage young people with mental health needs, we need, services need to speak their language, and their language is not always hi, I have depression, or hi, I have anxiety. They often are expressing feeling anxious, feeling stressed, feeling tired. They're expressing things and feelings, which is kind of what we teach them as, as children. I have young children, right? And I'm always like, what are you feeling? Label the emotion, you know? And then all of a sudden we expect them to be able to translate feelings into diagnoses. And I think oftentimes, many youth, not just because of stigma, though I think stigma prevents them too, but many youth just don't use the same language as mental health services or employment services. Even like on college campuses, most accommodations are given through some kind of office that says disability services. And most young people I talk to with mental health conditions say, F no, I do not have a disability. I struggle with mental health. So the idea of them walking into, of their own volition, walking into a disability services and saying, hi, I belong here, can you help me? It's just, it's just not gonna work. So I, it's, I get really fired up as you can tell, but I think this, I appreciated Alexis, you saying like, I didn't know how to articulate what I was feeling. I can relate to that on a personal level. I remember going through struggles as a young adult and being like, I don't know what this is, but I definitely wasn't saying, I think I have major or depressive disorder, you know, and then bringing that to somebody. So we've really got to be careful. And that's where I think that meeting young people where they're at, how are they talking about what they're feeling and then pulling them in from there. I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> oh, Sean, I think you're muted. Well, I, I, um, I was wondering if Alexis would like to react to that because that was the question uh, that was the first question I was going to ask really is, you know, what is, you know, for young people, what is the way that they refer to it when they're on discord, whatever that happens to be. Um, you know, I don't know if you've got any insight into that Alexis or, or not. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I, I really I wonder, I really wonder, and I don't even consider myself like a young adult. So I need to like ask my younger sister. Um, but no, I, I definitely think that there it's like mental health is now a little bit more popular of a discussion, which I appreciate. I just think at times like young adults, and I can say this myself too, is that will downplay a lot of things. So I think that like, and that's the thing too, is like as no, mental health is becoming more popular discussed, I think that people are gonna normalize certain things like depression, like anxiety, 
Um, and then that becomes like a normal thing. Okay, everybody's depressed, so whatever. Like, you know what I mean? So I think that there are times where counselors can be more intuitive, more investigative. If a student says like, yeah, I'm feeling depressed today. And it's like, they say it as if it's no big deal, but you as a professional can be like, okay, let's, let's unpack that a little bit more. Cause I think even for me, like I said, when I had gotten that diagnosis, I didn't tell my parents. Cause I was like, whatever, I'm, I'm depressed. I feel like she's probably right. It's whatever. What can my parents really do? But to bring that up to my counselor, she immediately was just like, wait, how are you feel? Like she made me feel like it was something worth exploring. And that's kind of what made me say, okay, well, like, let's see where this goes. And before I knew it, it, like things started to make sense. I started to freaking, uh, excuse me. I started to find people that I could, you know, depend on and ask for support if, and it just kind of, I think it really just made me feel like I understood myself a little bit more. So yeah, great point, Kate, um, Catherine. That's what I was going to say too. Awesome. Great, thank you. You know, one of the things, um, you know, the, because Alexis is in post-secondary education and, and we certainly know that young people with mental health challenges, they don't either access, as you said, Catherine, they don't access post-secondary education or, or they, they don't complete post-secondary education. Um, so what, is, what, is, what are some of the supports? I mean, you alluded to some of the things, right, with the disability services office, but are there, uh, what, are, what are other ideas that you would say to not only support a person in post-secondary education, but maybe help a, a person build the skills so they know what they're getting into and, and be able to support themselves, right? So it's kind of like, how do we prepare young people for success? And then what are some of the supports maybe available on the other side if, if they would need to be there? Yeah, that's great. Or Alexis, sorry. You can go. You can. Either, either way, Alexis or Catherine or Larry, whoever wants to jump in. Yeah, I mean, I'll say one thing, uh, Alexis, I appreciated hearing more of your story because you illustrated some of what I've heard from talking to young adults in my research, just this idea of like, I was a good student. I, I'm smart, <laughs> you know, but everything came crashing down on me. Um, and I think that's a very common experience in college. Um, I'm working with a colleague on, I'll put a link um, in the chat on this initiative called Hype, but it's essentially a supported, a blended supported employment, supported education initiative that is built off some of the IPS values, um, but we're delivering it in a college setting at R Binghamton University in New York. And it is, um, it's innovative. So this isn't available on any, any campus, of other campus, we're trying to build the evidence, but it is like one-on-one -on -one support. But the, a big component of it is executive functioning. So just in terms of learning how to manage multiple classes, learning how to manage your time, learning how to manage your tasks, how to break up like this huge paper that is looming for you at the end of the semester, how to break that up into smaller pieces. Because those skills help manage the stress, which will then help you manage your underlying symptoms of depression or anxiety. And so some of this, I think all young adults could benefit from. They don't teach this stuff in high school anymore. And I think that's a disservice. But for young adults with mental health conditions who are maybe more prone to stress or to that, oh my God, I can't now even get out of bed and even call out. I need to ghost on this job or I'm just gonna stop showing up in classes. They need tools for managing all of that. Um, and I think the same could be said for, for the workplace, um, managing the stress, communicating what's happening, those kinds of things. Um, that's what I would say. Um, and I think more colleges, college mental health, more colleges are paying attention to it more colleges are talking about it, but I do think there's still a lack of services. Mm -hmm. So here's a big one. And Larry, I want you to jump in on this one too. This is from a, a, our old uh, a friend, Jessica Queener. And, and I think this is such a great point. And I, I would be remiss if, if I didn't get this question in. Uh, she says, mental health services do not always meet students where they are at whether it's physical place or financially. And several trained specialized private psychology groups often do not take health insurance. You often have to pay out of pocket for services, which leads to students not getting help until they are at a crisis point. The question is, are there any efforts at the national policy level to provide systemic change to our mental health system? So this is kind of your opportunities to, to let us know what you know about what is happening 
in the pipeline, what are some of the conversations about changing some of these barriers? And I would, you know, Larry, if you want to jump in first on that, or I know that's a big one, but I knew that. Mm -hmm. I put it in. Well, I, you know, having worked in the field for a long time, we're at such a better place today than we were 30 years ago that the opportunity for pre ets that VR has a specific service for, for a wide swath of people that everybody's eligible, you don't, to apply for work for pre ed services, parent, it's a separate entity from standard VR. You know, parents don't have to fill out any uh, financial information. If, if you have private insurance, it doesn't impact it. So as a, as a kind of a, a stepping stone to uh, access to adult services, I, you know, I highly recommend applying to pre ets and, and seeking out work-based learning experiences and getting attached to an agency. That, um, you know, the other thing is that the Affordable Care Act has made a gigantic difference because, uh, you know, students, uh, uh, young adults have access to Medicaid, which gets them access to, to services. So that makes a big difference. That, um, I don't know that, that there is a specific uh, national trend that's happening today that's, that's gonna, um, that doesn't build on those two things. Catherine, you may, you may be aware of that. Well, I mean, on the mental health services, more general out, I mean, that's a great overview, Larry, of on the employment side of things. And I think we all, are here because we're in the field or have loved ones who have needs. And I think we can all agree that there is a crisis in terms of lack of enough mental health services. And that crisis was existed again pre-pandemic and now during and post-pandemic, um, you can't, I mean, there is some areas, regions where you can't find a psychiatrist who's taking any new clients, you can't find a therapist. And again, for a young adult to maybe finally say, I need help, and then not have access to that help is very concerning. So I agree and get very frustrated by this. Um, again, the conversations about mental health are becoming more normative. I remain optimistic that at the federal level um, with the newer administration that some of the conversation about mental health services on a national level may change. Um, but there's many other priorities right now, um, and I'm not going to get too political, but it, mental health was not a priority of the prior administration. Um, it just it just wasn't. Um, so SAMHSA, the um, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, there are some really important champions within that group, um, especially in regards to young adult mental health, um, really are trying to push through some great initiatives. And, um, you know, system level change, it does take a while to see change. I am similarly buoyed by the improvements I've seen in the last 10 years and hope that over time um, we will get, it really boils down to resources and those resources being available. Um, but I don't have the solution. I think yeah. advocating for any of us who can advocate at any point, sometimes change at the state level really starts with one champion. Um, you need one, Department of Mental Health Administrator, State Administrator to understand that change needs to happen and who can put themselves on the line to make that change. So we can all do our little bit. Yeah, uh, also- uh, Larry, so, I gotta cut us, or let, Larry, I'll give you the last word. I got about 30 seconds. I just think if you have any mental health agencies out there or VR directors, to, to establish initiatives specifically on transition age youth with, with men, mental health issues and make it one of your agency priorities to improve the quality and quantity of services and access. There, that that it's a, it is known as a challenging group to work with and that and we have to prioritize it. And I, you know, I look at it as primary care for, for, for kids with, with mental health issues. I want to thank, um, I want to thank Catherine. I want to thank Larry. I want to thank Alexis, uh, all three of you. This has been great. The hallmark of a great webinar is when the time flies. 
There are, thank you everybody who joined us with the great questions. And I think the final point is the best point. Speak truth to power. You are advocates for all students with disabilities and you guys out there are ones making the change.